Thank you, Abram. That was great. And it's going to be even better when your feet reach all the way to the pedals. I can, I'm looking forward to that day. Well, have you ever wondered why we call a group of fish a school? We do. You know the term a uh, school of fish, right? We use it uh, uh, often. I trust that uh, this will advance. No, it's not advancing. We might have to start over. I got a little something for you to see if it will work. It looks like it's working from here, Brad. Let's try it again. Uh, so, school of fish. Why do we call a group of fish a school? Anybody got any ideas? Does anybody actually know? I'm not going to make you say it in front of us, but does anybody know? Okay, good. I'm bringing you something new, some new understanding. Let's see. Nope, still nothing there. Okay, we'll try this over here. We'll go to settings, and media 2.4 is where I'm at. It looks good from up there, according to the boss. Not God, but Brad. Um, now we've got something else going. What's that about, Brad? Uh, yeah, if you look real closely, maybe you'll see a, a school of fish there. Let's try this, this. And this, have you been cogitating on why we might be calling a school of fish a school of fish? Well, here's an answer. There we go. So it will work. So is it because they're smarter, do you think? Anybody think that? The fish seem smart to you? No, wolves seem a lot smarter, and we just call them a pack. Bees can make magical honey. Anybody like honey? That's an amazing thing. They come together and they make honey. I love honey. But we just call them what? A swarm. A swarm of bees, which doesn't sound much smarter than a gaggle of geese. Not smart things. So why do fish get to be called a school? The word school comes from the Dutch, evolves from the Dutch word school, which means a group of animals of any kind, fish, dogs, birds, just a group of animals, nothing to do with intelligence, with smarts, with learning. It was the Greeks that associated the word school specifically with a group of learners, students, or a place of learning. Greeks loved to group together, if they had any free time, to learn, to learn stuff, stuff about life, stuff about stuff. They loved learning for understanding. That's what Mars Hill is all about. Mars Hill in the Bible. Anybody been to Mars Hill in Greece? Several people have. I've been there. It doesn't look anything too special, but that was just a symbol that endures of how much Greeks love to get together, talk about stuff, to learn and they had the deepest, broadest questions to understand what life's all about. They loved it. And American civilization largely draws from Greek culture. But did you know that our schools displaced education for the purpose of understanding with something else. For ages, public schools and others have displaced the purpose of education as understanding, displaced it with something else. Does anybody know what that something else is? Nobody? I'm not sure. I have no doubt you've experienced it. Here's a uh, from a government study, government research that surveyed all kinds of education back in 2000, and this is the result of their study. 
Many curricula have emphasized memory rather than understanding. Textbooks are filled with facts that students are expected to memorize, and most tests assess students' ability to remember the facts. So what displaced understanding in our educational system? Memory, memorizing. Success depends on the ability to memorize names, dates, places, rather than actual understanding the subject. Anybody uh, familiar with that? That was my experience. History in particular, I remember just, man, this is a drag. Now I love history, but back then going through school, to memorize these names, dates, and places. That was my history. It was the norm from grade school to grad school for generations in this country. Memorize. So normal that it's hard to imagine school as ever being anything different. Even though it doesn't make sense to displace the idea the purpose of educating for understanding would just memorize. You know, you ever cram for a test? Up late the night before, you didn't read the whole quarter, but now it's time for final exam, and what do you do? You're looking for those words to fill in the blanks or the multiple choice. Just pack those into your short-term memory, hope you can recall it the next morning, and you pass the test. Do you understand the subject? No. There's, there's medical doctors who made it all the way through medical school because they were great at memorizing. But I know some I would not want to have as my personal doctor. So memorizing in place of understanding does not make sense. How did we get to where memory is more important than understanding in our schools? Much of it can be traced to the Counter-Reformation. Studies in Christian education bring out that to counter the Reformation, Jesuits established schools throughout Europe so impressive that Protestants literally handed their children over to their care. Superior formal education that they showed spectacular in their methods caused the Protestants to hand their kids over, which seriously over time squelched the Reformation. And the papal system of education makes no effort to train students to be self-governing, for such training is fatal to the papal church organization. That studies in Christian education, page 145. Their top-down system of control, of power, of authority, of government, of organization, that whole system of belief required that, quote, if you look on the screen, the memory was cultivated as a means of keeping down free thought. The Jesuits did not aim at developing all the faculties of their pupils, but merely the receptive and reproductive facilities. Not teaching how to think, but what to think. Memorize these answers. You pass the test. You get your degree. You get a good job. You support a family. Anybody? Does that sound familiar to anybody? Hey, I just need the degree. C's get degrees. I get the job. I get out, I get the degree, I get out of school, I graduate, I get a job, I get a family. Originally, oh, here's another one for you. Originality and independence of mind, love of truth for its own sake, were not merely neglected, they were suppressed in the Jesuit system. And it was through the schools, these elite universities, this educational system, that reached out and infiltrated also the Protestant churches. As one non-Adventist Protestant 
scholar Edward Farley observed in the 1980s after massive research, looking back through generations, he says, quote, understanding as a paradigm for church, which would be you and I together, and clergy, which would be me, church and clergy education had, quote, not been operative in the church for many generations. So I have his research. Looking back, he says, hey, where's understanding? It's not in our education. Ejected from the paradigms which govern the interpretation of understanding. And Battle Creek College was no exception. They fell right into line. Our first college, Seventh-day Adventist College, is E.A. Sutherland, the early Battle Creek College president, traced how this happened. Our, quote, our first college system of education came from popular religious colleges that already existed, which came from Harvard and Yale. You know those names, Harvard and Yale, which come from Oxford and Cambridge, which get their system from Paris University presided over by papists. So our first college was permeated with the example, with the system of ed education that they looked up to. So permeated, so badly, that Ellen White told us, Adventist parents, don't send your kids to our college. Can you imagine doing something like that today? They said, hey, don't send your kids to our school next door. Don't do it. How do you think that would go over? Not well. So here's her, one of the founders of our church, telling church members, don't send your kids to our college, such as it is in this condition. She wrote, every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the creator, individuality, power to think and to do. It is the work of true education to suppress this power. Is that what it says? No. To do what? Develop this power. What power? The power to be an individual, to think and to do. To develop this power, to train the youth to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of other men's thought. It is a rad radical shift of educational practice. She led the way in educational reform in Adventist education. Here's another quote. The human mind is brought into communion with the mind of God, the finite with the infinite. It, in this communion is found the highest education. It is God's own method of development. Statements like these led the way in educational reform in our church movement. And research, current research in the last 20 years, is finally catching up with what she said so long ago in regard to one aspect, an important aspect. As a not, the non-Christian -govern, non government study promotes, She's, it says, quote, this is from the study, the research that I read earlier from back in 2000. One of the hallmarks of the new science of learning is its emphasis on learning with understanding. After centuries, these non believers, these are just government, secular, with no religious affiliation, they say, hey, we noticed. We look back and we don't educate for understanding. We need to do something different. Not, no context of religion, just simply, hey, our schools, they've adopted the system started way back then that promotes memorization without a purpose of of understanding we want to do something different the new 150 years after Ellen White wrote about it this new science of learning includes understanding 
So they finally caught on to the importance of teaching for understanding. But does that make public school completely safe to hand our kids over to? I'm a product of public school education, recovered from some things. There were some good Christian people went to our public school that remained Christians. Many Christians ask, why pay for school when you can get it for free? Isn't that a reasonable question? I remember when I first learned about people paying to send their kids to, to school. I don't mean college. We all got to pay for that. I mean elementary school even. And junior high or what they call academy. What we call, Adventists call academy. Why pay for what you can get for free across the street? Even have a bus come right to your house and pick your kids up and bring them there. Why pay? But think of a bigger question. What's your purpose in educating your children? What is your ultimate purpose? Public schools do have worthy goals. If you look on, I think it's the national uh, statement or um, philosophy, is to educate for educational excellence and preparation for global competitiveness. I want that. I think that's a good thing. I want my kids to have that, to be competitive in the world and not end up being down the street digging out of garbage barrels because they couldn't get a good job or something. Educational excellence and preparation for global competitiveness are worthy goals. And what they're saying lately is we are better at teaching for understanding. So we're going to be even better at teaching that. So those are good things, but we have to be wise as to what comes with their package, with their teaching. Here's uh, another quote from the government uh, study, what they're promoting, what they're sending out to the public schools. Students often have developed beliefs about physical and biological phenomena that do not fit scientific accounts of these phenomena. These preconceptions must be addressed in order for them to change their beliefs. Well, that sounds reasonable, but what beliefs would that be? What, what physical and biological phenomena might their government school package differ from ours? What are they talking about? Their science that they refer to as the ultimate definer of truth, if you think about it, it holds a presupposition. If you study into what scientific worldview is, it has a sub presupposition that rejects any supernatural account of sexuality, race, or most obviously creation their framework does not include, does not allow for the possibility of supernatural action, activity. So according to their evolutionary theory, you and I, we just happen. There's, there's no purpose. There's no meaning. As one author summarized, from goo through the zoo to you. That's, that's it. No purpose, no ultimate meaning, and they wonder why their kids are shooting up other kids. When they're promoting, when their undergirding philosophy is that you don't matter. You get born, you live, you die, life goes on. I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I am not saying that everyone who comes out of public school is going to be an evolutionist or an atheist. And certainly not all schools are equally aggressive at promoting these things. I know Brad and his family is going to Keene, Texas, where they're going to put their, Bailey's going to go to, um, I mean, Erica is going to, no, 
I got, I'm working my way through the family to Kiera, is going to go to public school. You know why? All the teachers are Adventist. Keene is one of those little Adventist bubbles. So perhaps they're safe with that. But uh, I suspect they would hear if the, the school system was going to push them, push the teachers harder into promoting their agenda, which I suspect will happen at some point. <clears throat> the point is, if your kids are going to be in a public school, beware of what is being taught and that they are ramping up their effectiveness at dismantling the development of God and promoting their own agenda of development. So in answer to the question, what is the best education? I think it depends on your goal for education. A good job with a big income? Nothing wrong with that unless that's your only goal. As Jesus said, what does it profit <clears throat> if one gains the whole world but loses his own soul? How much worse to lose the soul of your own children? Of course, it goes without saying, and for many people that I know, it is true, attending an Adventist school does not guarantee you'll keep your faith forever, that there'll be a spot in heaven awaiting. It is not a guarantee. However, however, I've heard of a lot of, a, a lot of parents acknowledge that the spiritual components are there in our schools. They are there. But your little schools, I've heard, your little schools just can't compete with the scholastic abilities of the big schools. There's so many more kids, so many more teachers, so many more things for them to do. Your little schools can't compete. So I want to share with you, Brad can get it set up, a short video clip <clears throat> from a documentary on Adventist education by a non-Adventist, Martin Doblemeyer, for public education. It is, it's uh, probably three, three to four minutes long, but I think it's worth watching. So, Brad. All right. Many parents are afraid that they will, their child will not get the same quality of education in a small school. To Classroom make their size was one of several concerns Adventists were hearing about their schools. There was a decline in enrollment, and then there was a decline in confidence. That is, parents were not as confident as they used to be about whether or not Adventist education was delivering quality academics. And we had no hard data. So to gather that data, they combined both the standardized Iowa test, now known as the Iowa Assessments, and a cognitive ability test designed to show a student's projected level of achievement. They called the study Cognitive Genesis. Over four consecutive years, more than 52,000 students in more than 800 Adventist schools took the test. We tested every child in third grade through ninth grade and 11th grade across the U.S., Canada, and Bermuda. Think about the fact that we are an extremely diverse church with an extremely diverse population. So one of the really unique things about this is the longitudinal nature of the study and the fact that it was essentially a population sample. It wasn't just a handful of schools. They, they actually got just about everybody to participate. And that's unique. Uh, as near as we can tell, it is several million students a year who take the Iowa assessments. So these days, when one administers the Iowa assessments, not only can um, one find out how the children uh, in your school did uh, compared to the nation, but also how well they're advancing along to mastery for that level of Common Core State standards. In all grades and in all subjects, 
students in Adventist schools performed above the national average. And the Cognitive Abilities Test showed that children in Adventist schools were performing beyond their expected level and improved with every year. To the extent that kids are actually becoming more able to reason about unfamiliar problems, that's a, a really important outcome, I think, especially in a world that's ever-changing. We came up with uh, characteristics of students uh, that correlate with high achievement such as reading just for pleasure, having positive friends, good communication with parents, um, students who ate well, who slept at least eight or more hours, and who exercised. Those students had higher achievement. Do you see a man students who identified themselves as being spiritual and who were interested in spiritual things, those students had higher achievement. The cognitive genesis study actually shows that there is a, a higher performance of students in small schools. There is no academic advantage for being in a, in a large school, despite the fact that many parents say, well, I don't want my children going to a small school. I want them to go to a, a large school where they have a science teacher and they move from classroom to classroom. That's not what the research is showing. So. I don't have any trouble with sending my kids to this little school we have next, next door. And don't think that it's because, well, you're the pastor, you have to. I don't have to. I have a choice. I don't think it's perfect, but I believe it is far and away my best option. And in case you missed what he, she said, the lady toward the end, I'll repeat it. In all grades and in all subjects, students in Adventist schools performed <clears throat> above the national average and improved year by year. So the film is called The Blueprint, The Story of Adventist Education. You can look at it more on YouTube. But Adventist students, the other thing that they brought out, which is significant, is more able to reason with unfamiliar problems. We should be. They should be because we've been way ahead of the curve at teaching for understanding. That is a thread of the education re reform that we still hold on to. That's the kind of education we promote as a church. One way we do that, as Virgil mentioned is our, in, our, in the announcements, is the budget. If you look on the, but if you look in the back of the uh, bulletin, we don't just contribute $27,000 out of the school budget. When you contribute to the budget, we take that part. But in the back, you see tax school budget. That's separate than ours, $11,500. <clears throat> It'll be updated more regularly when Jim is uh, back in the office, but... The point is, that's your opportunity to contribute to Adventist education more directly. That is one way to support Adventist education, the kind that you see promoted. Another way, perhaps the most important way, we all can support Adventist education is by taking part in it ourselves. I don't mean formal go to class. I mean, education is about more than what just happens at school. In fact, this is part of what we promote. True education means more than pursuing a certain course of study. It has to do with the whole person and with the whole period of existence possible to human beings. Is that a pretty broad approach, do you think? The whole period of existence possible to human beings. How, how long is that period of existence based on what you've learned in this church or if you went to our school in our church? How long is that period of existence? Unending. Eternal. You don't get that in a public school. You're not going to. That is is also what this discipleship seminar we're doing next weekend is about. About 
communion with God, about learning to know and follow Him closer and closer so that God's own method of development that we mentioned earlier comes to fruit in our lives. Communion with the mind of God, the highest education, that's God's method of development. So just in in closing, our scripture reading and summary, just condense it a little bit. He, God, also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. And goes on to say, get wisdom, get understanding. With all you're getting, get understanding. You've heard the motto, live and learn. How many heard that motto, live and learn? This has a little different take on it. It's learn and live. Amen? That's from God to you. You didn't need me to be in between. We are a priesthood of all believer organization. Any individual, right to God. Nothing between. We're going to have a closing hymn opportunity to uh, sing to this God. I invite uh, Craig to come forward and invite you to stand with us and we'll sing together.